Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're glad that you've joined us. We just want to talk about plants so much, spring and planting. So that's what we want to do uh, today. So we're glad you joined us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. But I have three really talented guests here with me and let's find out what their expertise is and you can direct your questions there way. Okay, let's start first with you, Mark Kemp. Okay, my name is Mark Kemp and I'm a landscape architect. Um, Go right ahead. I have an email here, it's about a Rosa Sharon, uh, a tall shrub. Uh, it says that she has a five-year-old Rosa Sharon and when should I prune it? It's a very, very common question. Um, that particular shrub uh, blooms on all new growth, so it's very, very forgiving in the sense of pruning. So you could do it late, late fall, through winter, uh, early spring. Um, and in the forgiving part of it, you're not gonna really damage the shape of it. So basically you wanna take out larger stems, larger branches down to the ground or diseased or dead branches. Um, and you don't really have to be too picky because there's so many flowers on the shrub itself that if you do prune out some um, later in the season and lose those flowers, you really won't lose that much of effect. You'll still get a nice flower display and those flowers will tend to be a little bit larger as well so um, real, real easy easy plant to take care of. Great people are planning already ahead yeah. for well really any pruning I think is what people are planning yes. ahead for. Thank you Mark very much. Now let's throw it over to you Paula Blakely in the middle. Hi I'm Paula and I work at Align IFS Farm Town. I had questions on carrots a Jessica writes for the last three years she's planted a variety of heirloom carrots and every year they come out with a strange taste they have no flavor they're bitter um, very disappointing she says she plants different types but they come out the same she plants in raised beds with compost manure peat and vermiculite and she's tried them in many different places so one of the things I would ask is when are you planting because they are, carrots are a cool weather crop. They, they like their temperatures between 40 and 80 degrees. So if you get them in too late, they're gonna be coming to maturity when the, wet, when the temperatures are too, too high. There are a couple of varieties that are generally um, better to, for the average gardener to plant. Nantes and Chantigny mm -hmm. are two varieties that are, that they're shorter, they're a thicker carrot, um, they're re recommended for home gardeners, um, and I'd say check your planting dates. Start a little bit earlier, or even planting later on in the in the in the fall, and try a fall planting of them. But I think they almost need to have. If she, sounds like her soil is great, yeah. she sounds like she'd be ready to go pretty soon. Yeah, I I I'd be good. Because I've a shot. tasted them bitter, but that's when we've had 90 degree summers, right. and it got really hot fast. So. So Paula's helping you out. So thank you, Jessica, for your question. Thank you, Paula. And now let's go to Dr. Jim Appleby. Well, I'm an entomologist in the uh, Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences here at the University of Illinois. And last week, Diane, you had a question concerning a gentleman that had problems with, with white fly on his hibiscus, an indoor plant. And I think I have the answer to that problem. Uh, this is a material, it's it's manufactured by a company called Bonide, B-O-N-I-D-E, and the product is called Systemic Household Insect Control. And uh, this is a systemic chemical that you apply, it comes in the granular form, so you use about two and a half teaspoons, or tablespoons, per six inch pot. You apply this to the soil, and then you work it into the soil, and then you water that. And uh, then the uh, chemical is taken up by the plant roots is translocated throughout the plant and will kill such things as white flies, mealybugs, scales, and aphids. So it's a really good product. Now there's one thing that the, uh, that the label does not indicate and I think it's important. If you have cats, and I got two cats this fall because of the mouse problem. I see. And they're doing a good job of taking care of the <laughs> mice. But anyway, cats have a tendency to drink uh, water from all sorts of places in the house. And I would be concerned if you apply this material and then the water drains out of the pot and your 
cats drink that water. I think that's a real danger there. So if you have cats, I would double pot the plant so the cats cannot get to the water. And I think if you use this, uh, you'll find that it's very effective. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that good follow-up, Jim. That sounds good. One other product that just came on the market last year is this product Roundup made by Monsanto. And it's called, it has this uh, comfort wand. And it's really a neat way. It's already ready to use. And, all you, and it's operated by a battery. So all you have to do is simply take off the wand and press the little wand and it will spray out. And it's so handy. I have patches of... Uh, Let's see, what is it? Uh, oh, the garlic mustard. Garlic mustard. Oh. It's beautiful to control garlic mustard. You I thought you were going to say it's beautiful. <laughs> no, no. No, this is beautiful to, to control. To control it. And then you have uh, the honeysuckle, the uh, Japanese honeysuckle, a vine. Very effective. Poison ivy. And it's so mm -hmm. handy to use. I really like this product with, with the wand that's operated off a battery. And no mixing. No mixing or anything. Ready to use. Very good. Great product. All right. And... We bring products that are good. We don't have any stock in any of these companies. So thank you, Jim, for that. Well, I wanted to remind you that there's a few spots left on the nine-day Germany trip that we are taking with WILL. So if you're interested in going, uh, we're going to send you something if you uh, get a hold of us at Will Travel or give us a phone call. But it's going to be a fun trip, and um, I'm hoping that you'll check it out. Also, send us your questions. We have some, but we can always use more. That way the panelists can fit their expertise. So you can go on Facebook, Facebook and search uh, Midam Gardener. And also you can email and you can, of course, mail us. So we'll have all of that info. Facebook was up now, but the other info will be at the end. So please send us questions. We'd be happy to hear from you. Well, we do have a uh, special did you know about peppers. We're thinking vegetable gardening. So let's go to the special did you know. Green sweet bell peppers have twice the vitamin C of oranges. Red and yellow bell peppers have four times as much. And they taste so good too, so that's a, that's a plus. Well, let's go to the phone lines and we're gonna start with Dick's question about hydrangeas on line one. Hello there, Dick. Hi. Hey, I planted a hydrangea last year for the first time. I did, did nothing to it in the fall. Now I have a lot of just big brown branches. I've even got a couple of blooms left. What do I do with it? Do I cut it all the way back or partly or tell me what to do? Okay, hydrangeas in the spring. I'm gonna throw it over to either of you guys on the end. I'd say the first thing you got to figure out is what kind of hydrangea. Right. Uh, what, what kind of hydrangea will determine whether you'll have flowers set to bloom um, in late spring, mid spring, um, or if they'll set later on in the, later on in the summer. Um, from the sounds of it, you, the bloom is still there. I would think it'd be more of a summer blooming. But uh, So then, can, uh, he can deadhead. Yes. Yep. Yeah, you could you could go ahead and take back the the stems that are a little bit dang, you know, that you don't like in appearance, and take those those flower heads off. If it comes out of the ground, and not from branches, um, it's probably the Annabelle or the a mop top. Um, it, so if the if the stems come out of the ground, you can probably cut that back two-thirds of the way and that'll, you know, get, get rid of all the dead wood and dead flowers. Mm -hmm. But if it comes off of a, a woody branch, I'd probably not prune. Right, I'd wait. Yeah. And if you don't know for sure, Dick, about your hydrangea, you could just study it this year and figure it out and then make notes and then go by their <laughs> suggestions. Very good question, thank you for that. And let's move along then to line two. And Peggy has a question for us about an oak. Hello there. Hello. Um, my husband and I planted a scarlet oak seedling uh, several years ago, and now it's getting quite tall. The, the lower branches now are 55 inches above ground. And... 55? So about six feet. Okay, okay. I we have a, we planted a scarlet oak seedling. Turn off your TV, by the way, and listen to us. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so it's your first branches are about six? 55 inches above the ground. Okay. And the problem is they're beautifully spaced and the branches above are more sparse. And uh, we can't mow under the tree with the, with the lawnmower. Um, but if I cut off those lower branches, then we just have sparse branches. I don't, and I can't tell from okay. looking at them how to prune the lower branches. If uh, that's what I need to do. Okay. You'd want to take advantage of this opportunity when it's still younger to take those branches off. Um, if they're in the way now, they're going to always be in the way. So if you want to take this opportunity when they're a little bit younger, it'll heal that, that much faster. Go ahead and cut those back to the collar, leaving that branching collar. Um, and make sure that it doesn't tear the, the, the trunk itself. So um, undercut. Yes, undercut first, get the weight off of the branch, and then take a, the short stub off. Um, I would think that your upper branches will, will be fine. They'll, they'll take over most of the growth, and, and it should be fine, especially if it's been, in do, been doing okay. Um, and with a scarlet, if you know it's specifically a scarlet, a lot of those branches will dangle down or angle downward anyways. So by taking those bottom few off now, you'll still have branches that drop you know, as it grows larger and larger. They are beautiful trees. So if you're not sure about those cuts, you can, either, you can check out at a library any book on mm -hmm. pruning or Google proper tree pruning techniques. Yeah. But the if you cut it straight down, it will rip down the trunk, and that is the saddest story I've ever seen. It yeah, it won't really, repair. It won't and repair. The two things you don't you don't want to leave a, a stub um, because that can rot and rot down in and cause problems, and then you don't want to cut too deep because that will also damage the But you the can see itself. that collar. Yeah, There's you can a physical see it. spot on there, so do look at s something before you prune it and it will give you a good idea about it. Okay. There, a primer on pruning. All right. Well, thank you Peggy for that question. Let's go to line 3. It's a raspberry question with Pete. Hi there, Pete. What's your question? Uh, I've been uh, pruning my black raspberry bushes and a uh, fella come by and told me that I had stock rot, and I'd better get some spray and spray them. And I was wondering what could I get to, to spray them to stop the, the uh, stock rot. I do not know. <laughs> I'd take a plant test over to the plant clinic I, I, and mm -hmm. make sure just because somebody says you've got it doesn't mean you do. Um, uh, and so maybe s once they tell you exactly what you've got, then you can get the right fungus fungicide and, and treat it the right way. We uh, might have a plant clinic graphic. I don't know. We used to have, but it's here on the University of Illinois campus. It's a Turner Hall address, and the they will identify it for sure. The other thing, I would make sure when you are pruning to keep your pruners clean, sanitize yes. them, make sure you do a good good cleanup, make sure that you, um, you know, are... Yeah, are clean up all the debris around the plant so that, and dispose of that. And you know, one other thing, uh, they call it raspberry rot, but I sort of wonder if that person didn't get confused that the old canes do die. The old canes I mean, are, that's, it's a, that's a normal. two year... That's right. That's normal, so... So uh, I would, I, I would I check. Wouldn't, yeah, I, I don't think you even have raspberry rot And myself. the old canes would be taken out, They're, they turn yeah. a browner right, color. Right, right. So I would be careful, but we will put that graphic up for the plant clinic um, in case you do want to send it, and that way be sure. But I would never spray with just someone telling you unless they tell right. you why they know that is the case. Possibly they're a plant pathologist or a master gardener, but even then I would check it out. But you're right, it could be the older branches. I think so. So, well good, thank you Pete for your question. Well, we're going to go to a surprise Lily question on line four, and Dave has a question for us. Hi. Hello there. What's your question? I want to know about surprise lilies. When they can be, when can they be dug up? Well, wouldn't you think there's a couple times? Yeah. Um, surprise lilies. Those are the ones that don't have the leaf that get the big, the, like the belladonna lilies, yeah. right? And the lilies, the, the leaves are leaf. starting to come out now. 
Right. So it's a possibility you could dig them now, but I think it's actually easier in the middle of the summer. I think you're right. After the flowers, is, yeah. Yeah, or later after the flowers. There could be three times you could do it, but I, I, I think I always taught it after it flowers. Yeah, it's not like daffodils where they have to be transplanted exactly. at different times. So. so Dave, there's a few ways to do it. You probably can't go wrong with any of the spring, summer, or fall, but after flowering, right after flowering, I think might be the easiest because you know where it is. That's the other problem. And they really are surprise lilies. Leaves first, people think they're daffodils, then later they flower, and then you know, surprise, those are not daffodils. Okay, well thank you for that question. Let's go to a couple more emails, and we'll start with you, Mark. Okay, um, <clears throat> I have a question here from uh, Laura in Metamora. Uh, sh she writes, I have two, two lilac bushes um, that ha have a full-size bloom, but no small shoots around the base. Uh, they have now grown to be 8 to 10 feet tall, which is a common size for a common or a hybrid um, lilac. Um, they were planted too close to the house. Uh, they're concerned about the foundation, and they also block the window. And But basically the question is, they're going to be doing some work on the house. Can they be transplanted? Are they too large for that? Or can there be cuttings taken because they do like the blossoms in, uh, in May? Um, it's a large purple flower. Um, there's a couple issues here, but to answer your specific question, yes, you could do cuttings. Um, your success would be, you know, uh, not great, but not poor. Um, you'd want to do multiple cuttings off of real green new growth. Um, but to be honest, with that type of shrub, you could find a replacement pretty easily, or if you wanted to risk transplanting it, it's possible. I've, I've done it before. You can cut it back by a third, um, take a large um, root ball and move it early in spring, and, uh, and then just keep it stress-free as much as you can. Um, if, it pat if it doesn't make it from there, then you would seek out a replacement from that point. But I wanted to point out the other thing of uh, just proper plant <coughs> placement too. I mean, the window's covered, the worry of the foundation, you know, m making the proper plant choice is important as well. So um, a lot of people don't do that research or they just assume it'll stay lower, they'll be able to keep it lower, and then you lose the flower because you're pruning it too hard or so forth. So um, I just wanted to take that. Do the work that, yeah. at a time. Yeah. That size of a shrub won't harm your foundation. There's no concern there. Um, but uh, if you want to go through the, through the risk and the work, you could transplant it. Uh, there's a chance. Okay, thank you very much. And I've been looking forward to what you have brought to show us, Paula. Well, oh, this. Yes, this, I've been looking forward to that. This is a Lenten rose or a Helleborus. They are also referred to as a Christmas rose sometimes because they bloom really early. Usually they'll start blooming in February or March. And uh, this is just a new cultivar. It's got some new beautiful flowers. So it's it gorgeous. Will, yeah, beautiful plant. It is it's just one of the first things that blooms in the spring. Mm. Whew. And it's hardy. And it's hardy. Hardy. Yeah. Okay. Many colors. Jim, did you have something for us next? Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Well, I do have an email here from uh, uh, concerning a colony collapse. What is the status? Status right now is that we do not know. Or there's no one answer what colony collapse in the bees. I wrote down a few things that uh, might be an insecticides. They blame some of the insecticides. Fungicides, viruses, stress, varroa mites, tracheal mites, uh, bacterial infections, lack of diversity in the nectar plants that are surrounding the uh, colony, low winter temperatures, starvation, not enough honey. So wow. those are all factors that could cause this collapse. I think within the Midwest, though, if you had a colony that was very strong going into the fall months, and then in the spring you have very few uh, bees left, I would look very carefully if you don't have tracheal mites or varroa mites, because they definitely uh, weaken the colony to such that uh, you know the colony declines and all of a sudden you don't have any more bees. So be sure mm -hmm. that you don't have those two mites. And that's, they're pretty common now in the Midwest, both, uh, both those mites. 
Okay. Well, um, interestingly enough, our next question is something to do with bees as well. And so let's go to line five. Cheryl has a question for us about bees. Line five. Hi there, Cheryl. If Cheryl is there. Oh, I wanted to hear your question about bees. Line five, Cheryl? I guess she's not there. She mentioned something about the possibility of them coming to seeds. Yeah. Bird seeds. And I have the same problem. They do come occasionally. But I think the bird seeds are getting wet. If they're yeah. completely dry, I don't think you'll have that problem. So try to get uh, a container that you don't have wet seeds, and I don't think the bees will be attracted. To I've never seeds. seen that. Um, they have drainage holes, and then we yeah. have platform feeders that are screen. Yeah. So I've never seen that. So the wet makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I think so. I think if, if they're wet, that's, that's the problem. Okay, very interesting. Well, let's go to line six next. And Josh has a question about, or a comment, I don't know which one, on Roundup. Hi there, Josh. Josh, are you there? Well, we are missing out on some calls. I hope we can get him back. Let's go to our Mid-American Gardener quiz, and it's something about spring flowers. Which flower is known traditionally as the first flower of spring? A, hosta, B, primrose, C, lily. B, primrose. Primrose is a perennial whose name means first rose. All right, well, let's go to a phone line and see if anyone will pick up. Is anyone there? I'll take any line, any person. Yes. Uh, and who are you? Mary. Okay. I have a question about controlling honeysuckle. All right. I have a well-established large wigelia bush with some very well-established honeysuckle. I assume it's a Japanese kind. It's white ones viney with white flowers yeah. growing up in the bush yeah. and I have tried for years to kill off the honeysuckle by pruning it, painting it with Roundup a couple times and uh, it's still there visiting. What's the best way to control it? We have the expert right here on controlling honeysuckle. Well I would follow the vine all the way down to the ground. I mean you're, you're going to find that it's sort of viney that it actually roots in several different places. So find that location. Just follow the main shoots down. And then I would treat the, that little, cut it off, of course, and then treat that little stump with some Roundup. And um, I think that should control it. It sounds like what's probably happening is you're killing off the one that you're finding, and then the other rooted section is, yeah. is taking off. So it's, you're going to have to be persistent with tracing it down to that source, painting that stem that you've cut off, and then if you see any new growth from anywhere else below the plant, taking care of that before it gets up and established. And there, I'm sure it has multiple stems, so right. it's yeah. just not one stem. There's also chemicals that you can use that are geared towards brush control, and so it's, it's going to go after the broadleaf weed, and it, it's, it acts a little differently than the glyphosate from Roundup does. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you might try that also if, if, if the Roundup doesn't give you the results you want. And if you have some major trunks, but then smaller things rooting in, you know, you can treat the major trunk, but a lot of times you can pull up at this time of the year. Yeah. yeah when it's at this time of the year, it is really, really easy. After a rain, too. After a rain, and you've got freezing and thawing, it seems like it's easiest to root um, to weed right now. Okay, thank you for that. We are going to go back and see if we can find Josh. Josh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. What is your question or comment? Um, well, I noticed the gentleman with the glasses, he was talking about, he recommended the Roundup. Mm -hmm. And I've done a little bit of research online about that, that it contains dioxin, which is the same thing that is in Agent Orange and that it causes cancer. I wondered what, how much he knew about that. Well, I think in excess that maybe it does cause, you know, uh, is carcinogenic in some respects. I, I don't know. There's a lot of misinformation, though. I think our government is pretty, pretty good in, in, in safeguarding the public on the use of these materials. So I wouldn't be too concerned about that. 
But you do want to use it in a very, no wind, a very small amount, cut. You were thinking cut, you were saying cut yeah, ends yeah. too. So yeah. you don't want to just be waving it around. I think you're safe as long as you follow the directions. Some of these things, uh, people don't follow the directions and you do have problems. Right. So that, it's a good follow up because you want people to use it right and and maybe not use it very much except for very problem things which were honeysuckle, honeysuckle. and other things that are hard to control Garlic another mustard. way because there are other things you can use so thank you Josh for following up on that and uh, thank you for your answers thanks everyone for being here it, it goes you. really fast it seems we love talking about things in the springtime you have a great week gardening we'll see you next time and goodbye <laughs>